Okay, <laughs> welcome back. I hope you all had a good lunch. We're only a few minutes behind schedule, and we'll probably be a little more behind schedule by the time we're through, but. We have a, a treat. Before the panel, Dr. Erica Padden Freeman is a woman of many talents. She was the personal advisor to the United Nations Interregional Direction Director for Youth Programs in Developing Nations. She wrote the first study of family life on a kibbutz in Israel. She founded and chaired the International Committee of Women for Human Rights. And her analytic training was personally supervised by Theodore Reich, much like the way that Freud personally, su Freud personally supervised Reich. She's the author of Insights, Conversations with Theodore Reich. Dr. Freeman. This is the book. <laughs> It was published by Prentice Hall. It's never been in paperback. It was supposed to be, a, I'm sorry, it was supposed to be a textbook because textbooks last forever. Unfortunately, one of the non-reading secretaries at Prentice Hall read the manuscript and they decided that if she'll read it, it better be a trade book. Trade book means for the general public. So it disappeared after a year. Nevertheless, I still have a few in the warehouse because that was the deal, if anybody's interested. Uh, Oh, no, that. All right, so I'll do this after I make my speech in case I forget what I was going to say. Because I, w I was going to bring it here and sell it here, and then they said the university would not allow to sell books. And I said, a university won't sell books? How about crack? <laughs> I suppose crack is easier to get than insights, but never mind. Uh, I met Dr. Reich um, through, well, he wrote, a, he wrote a book called, um, now let me go backwards. This is how it used to be when we did the book. We'd make a long story longer and kind of, <laughs> which we now call free association. Um, I was in Zurich some while ago and uh, Carl Jung, as you know, was living in Zurich. And I said to the person I was with, I said, listen, I think I'll call Carl Jung and see if I can get to talk to him. And the person said to me, why would Carl Jung want to talk to you? And I said to myself, he's right. Why should he talk? You little sootsicle from nowhere. Okay, Vienna, but that's not the same. So fast forward, Dr. Reich writes a book called um, On Jewish Humor and Wit and gives a speech at the, um, it's not a synagogue, it's not a temple, it's on 63rd Street. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, no, it's, it's a... Ethical culture. It's a Unitarian, thank you. Ethic. Anyway, he gave the speech, yes, he gave the speech there. Irrelevant, but I like, we both like, and everything I'm doing now, except for the fact that I'm a soprano, Dr. Reich used to do. In other words, think out loud, wonder out loud, let you answer the questions. And I, the reason we, I did this book is, now this is coming to it. Uh, anyway, he made this lovely speech, and then there was a party, and luckily I was invited to the private party. And he and I got to talking, and the things he said were so interesting that none of them each deserved a book, but I thought they should be preserved because we never know, we know the wisdom of the person who writes it, we know the facade of the intellectual exercise of the person writing the book, but you never have a sense of what it's like to be with them, how they think, what, what is the, the uh, simpatish, thread that's between the person and the way they express themselves. Okay, so we're talking for a long time, then he goes away and one of the NPAP uh, people who was of course there as well said to me, how come he talked to you so much? He never talks to anybody. I said, I don't know, maybe he's shy, maybe it's because I'm Viennese, who knows, you never can tell. Or maybe he had a few things left over from when he was speaking but he couldn't say them because he couldn't say them. There was no time, you know, the constraints we all have, both as attention keepers and attention getters. Anyway, next day I decided really there ought to be some way in which one could preserve the feeling, the ambiance, the back and forth kind of a ping pong of talking to such a man. 
And I, I was so impressed, I, could ha I hardly know what I said to him. And luckily, apparently, he did most of the talking because I was sort of, believe it or not, dumbstruck. But anyway, so I decided I would call and make an appointment. I, and I said, you know, we met um, some while, we met a few days ago, and, and uh, I was wondering if I could come and talk to you. He said, but yeah, didn't I tell you to call me and talk to me? Nice. I was too, you know how you get overawed by somebody? Many years later, when we had become good friends, and he used to come for brunch every Sunday, he finally said to me, you don't have to call me Dr. Reich anymore. You could call me Theo, Theodore. And our friend Theodore Bekel was there, who always said that when he always knew whom he knew from Vienna by who called him Teddy. And Dr. Reich said, you could even call me Teddy, which according <laughs> to his daughter-in-law, he never let anybody do, but OK. But I didn't have, I couldn't. It was like, oh. I, I think you know what I mean. You get sort of overawed by somebody that, you can't help but love them, but there is a kind of a, ca uh, what is that, a moat between you. And even though they emptied out, the water is still there and you can't quite cross it. But anyway, that, so when the information said Theodore Reich the man, I felt a little, it wasn't true. It was Theodore Reich the teacher, the, the psychoanalyst, the mensch, the grandfather, so the only really thing I know personally about him is that he was extreme. Notice I'm getting off the, no sequences here, just free association. <laughs> Bear with me and, and the rest will be organized by the panel. <laughs> um, okay, so I call him up. He says, I said, when can I, he said, do you want to write an article? I said, well, I don't know. I, I thought maybe like a book or something. He said, well, um, when can you come? And I said, well, when can I come? He said, how about in an hour? <laughs> so I said, yes. So I, as I'm leaving, some people there, and they say, where are you going? And among the people was the person who, told, who asked me why the hell should Carl Jung talk to me. And the reason I thought I, didn't, I wasn't afraid is because when we were on the plane from Zurich to America, this some yold had gotten to, to Carl Jung and had three hours of conversation with him and wrote about it in the Herald Tribune. And I said to myself, well, if he can, okay. So now, since I was semi-invited, I said, I'll tell you when I get back. Because I figured the last thing I wanted to hear is why should he want to talk to you? But he did. So then we talked a great deal and he showed me around his office. And there he was in his gray doctor's uh, coat. I don't know if it was meant to be gray or if it was just old and gray, but you know how these things get. <laughs> smoking like a ch and his all his walls covered with pictures of Freud so we, we talk a number of things and and uh, he said no so what are you doing I said well I'm studying to be an analyst and I said listen you know how it is if you're going to be an analyst you might as well come from Vienna so we sort of have that in common <laughs> and uh, as so what he says well I think maybe a, a book might be a good idea I said, articles are no good. I am a procrastinator. In fact, some months, years later, when I didn't quite finish the book, the reason I didn't is because it kept him alive, sort of. But that's another story. Uh, he's, he wrote and said, I'm going to build you a, a monument to procrastination. But anyway, so as I'm leaving, he goes to the bookshelf and he takes out a book called Le the, the Temptations of St. Anthony by Flaubert. And he said, this is the kind of, he said, I, I did my dissertation on this. Uh, this is how I met Freud. And then he took out another book and said, <clears throat> Le dernier conversation avec Anatole France, the last conversations with Anatole. He said, now that's the kind of book I like. I said, okay, that's the kind of book we'll write. And that's how we began writing. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the thing about Dr. Reich was that he was extremely modest and he used to, complained to me that I was too modest. He says, don't be like me, I don't push myself. It's one of, the thing about him is that he was totally empathetic to people. And what was important to him was the person he was with, not he himself. I've never seen anybody lacking narcissism that much. And I think a little narcissism is good for you. Because there's some of us, especially females, who don't have nearly enough of it. <laughs> uh, and so I, I So when I, I came back and uh, told the people 
where, where, because I was flying, and I, I, was, I was no longer touching Earth. And they said, what, what's with you? Where have you been? And I got a funny look from my husband. I, he said, how come you look that happy? I said, I was just so Dr. Wright, and we're going to do a book together. OK, fast forward. We discussed everything, but everything led to everything else. And we talked about the fact that sometimes the serendipity in bad things happening is usually a good thing to happen. For instance, when he left Holland uh, to come to America in 38, he had a patient, free association, he had a patient whose name I've now forgotten, but I know the rhyme that goes with the name, but I don't know which one, which is, Boston, the city of the bean and the cod, where the cabots speak only to the lodgers and the lodgers speak only to God. Now, yes, so it was either a cabot or a lodge. But anyway, he was the American ambassador to Holland, who happened to be a patient of Dr. Reich's. Now, it's not in the book because we didn't want to call cabot or lodge. Uh, it's too famous a name, and we didn't want to put any names in the book that would be recognizable, and they might... They, they were very um, delicate about everything. So Ambassador Cabot Lodge, let's say, though there was such a person, but anyway, one of them, the said Lodge. to, the thank Lodge. you, the, 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 the ambassador in Holland, yes? Okay, thank you. So <laughs> said to him, Dr. Reich, the Nazis are coming and it's not gonna be safe for you. Now that's another reason I didn't put it in the book because we didn't know whether Lodge could get in trouble for having given a visa to an undocumented alien. <laughs> anyway. In those days, we didn't call them that. Uh, and so he got Dr. Reich a visa within a week and came to Vienna, to America. So then he tried to join the New York Psychoanalytic, which was a particularly closed place in which they had only physicians uh, as analysts and anybody else was called lay. Now, you know that Freud wrote the book on the question of lay analysis, particularly in defense of Theodore Reich. So he could get no patience, and he had no way of making a living. And he had said, you know, it's interesting, when I was in Vienna, everybody wanted me to study law. And he said, what would I have done with Austrian law in America? I'm glad I became an analyst. So now he's in America. He can't get any patience, because the New York Psychoanalytic is not sending him any real patience. What they did do, however, was submit themselves to him. So that a lot of his patients were psychoanalysts, <laughs> members of the New York Psychoanalytic. But the best part of it is, and this is a way of making lemonade out of lemons or limes or whatever, um, is that he had to earn a living because he had a family. So he wrote a book called Listening with the Third Ear, which then made him into a household name. And finally, he got to have a title that even though he admitted taking it from the Hester Dorton, Nietzsche, uh, now it, he, when you say Listening with the Third Ear, that's Theodore Reich. That's what he listened to. And he was the one who taught me about Basically, it's listening like sonar. He always used the example of, of the old Indian guide who uh, nobody could hear anything. And the Indian guide is it now Native American. They used to call them Indian guides. Uh, <laughs> put, would put his uh, ear on the ground, on the desert ground, and there would be the vibrations. And he could hear the horse's hoofs far away. And Reich said, and that's basically what we do when we listen with the 30. And I said, yes, it's like sonar. You know, you go ping and you know there's a whale there or a dolphin or basically some, something's cooking that hasn't come yet, but that will emerge. <clears throat> and that maybe you can even prevent coming or kind of rearrange it in some way. He was particularly fond. Oh, we had discussions about bilingualism. He was talking about the fact that a lot of young Americans could only speak one language. And I said, thank God. That was a long time ago, no offense. I am not for what Arizona is doing. But in those days, uh, we all did. But we spoke many more than one, alas. We had to. And in those days, it seemed to me a great luxury that you spoke only one. No, he said, look, I have an adorable granddaughter whose mother is French. Mignon? Uh, that's her name. That's the mother's name. Uh, and so the little girl is bilingual. And one day, she's sitting in her high chair eating a banana, and she finished a banana, and she wanted more. And so she turns to the mother, the little girl does, and says to her, more banana, no answer. More banana, no answer. 
silence. Encore, banana. <laughs> she thought that maybe the mother didn't quite understand it. And that seemed to me a, a perfect way of empowering a child, of un making a child. So, OK, then I was for bilingualism. I'm for trilingualism because uh, in my case, I'm the last of the Viennese. That's it. After me, everybody's American. And, uh, but in my case, uh, when I was a little girl, um, my mother said I was going to get violin lessons. And I said, but young ladies don't study the violin. They study piano. And she said, no, with the violin, she can run. And two years later, I ran. Uh, I was lucky. I only was with Hitler for two years. But still, there was. But Anyway, so he came in 38 from Holland, which was I'm grateful to Lodge about. I don't want to take up too much time because I've got lots, lots more stories that you might want to hear or not. Uh, oh, I'll tell you one story. Of, uh, of when, uh, first of all, he invented a thing called social masochism, which means not sexual masochism, social, because we have to take so much guff from our patients without retaliating. Not guff is not the word, but you know what I mean. Some of you. <laughs> Uh, without retaliating, without becoming negative, or without interjecting, you know, because sometimes some of our patients are more intelligent than we are, alas. Dr. Reich once said, he said, I have a patient who is a Nobel laureate. He's much more intelligent than I. He can think rings around me. He says, but I have resolved my emotional conflicts and my emotional turmoil so I can help him. That's how modest he was. And the social masochism, as he called it, is... One of the traits he felt we should have, we need to have, or we probably do have, which is what draws us to it, is to take all this guff and turn it into something positive without retaliating, without punishing. Uh, I, are you going to stop me? No, no, go ahead. Five more minutes? Yeah. That's oceans of time. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> let's see, what was I going to tell you? Oh, the Bruno Walter story. Bruno Walter was the second, Gustav Mahler, this was Vienna almost 100 years ago, a long time ago. And Gustav Mahler, whom you probably know better as a composer, was the uh, conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic. And Bruno Walter was his number two man. And one day, Bruno Walter developed uh, a paralysis of his arm. For a conductor, not useful. <coughs> So he came, this is a story that Reich told me that Freud told him. He came to um, Freud and Freud said, okay. And this was an example in how you don't always have to interpret because some people cannot tolerate interpretations. And sometimes I believe in, in uh, interpretation is a form of hostility because I reingesucht. You know, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It, so, he, uh, so Freud said to, uh, to um, uh, Walter, do you know Taormina? And Bruno Walter said, yes. And Freud said, why don't you go there for two weeks? And when you come back, you'll feel much better. Explanation. Freud told Reich, Reich told me, it's in the book, I think, uh, that Freud knew that Gustav Mahler had been invited to become the guest conductor of the Budapest Philharmonic. So he knew that in two weeks' time, Marla would be out of Walter's hair, and then Walter could get to conduct the Vienna Philharmonic. And of course, the reason Walter had developed, I'm sure you can guess, this paralysis was pure guilt, because unconsciously he wished Marla dead so he could conduct a little bit. <laughs> he didn't have to. So just by, by simply suggesting the vacation, the, what's behind the suggestion was the total understanding analysis of the guilt that the, that the young conductor was feeling, I suspect there was more to it, because the truth is Bruno Walter was madly in love with Alma Mahler, who was a dumb cow if ever there was. I don't know what's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, men, men seem to love a narcissistic woman. This woman was totally madly in love with herself. So she gets uh, Mahler, she gets Kokoschka, she gets Franz Werfer, it's not fair. And... <laughs> And Gropius. And, and Gropius, not Sue. 
and Bruno Walter madly, you know, not daring, having to get a little paralyzed, partly because of, I'm sure, because of the conducting, but I'm sure there's another part that had to do with uh, the fact that he was in love with her. And so when they said to her, you know, Bruno Walter's in love with her, she said, what is, I'll tell you what it really is. She says, he looks too Russish, meaning race-like, meaning too Jewish. So that stupid cow rejected Bruno Walter because he looked too Jewish. Happened to have been a rather handsome fellow, because I'm prejudiced, because I'm Jewish. I figure, you know, what? But this is advice to some of you women who are too intelligent, which they cannot be, but if you show your intelligence, sometimes it runs a little over, your cup runs over. Don't show it. <laughs> Just do narcissism and they'll all fall. They'll all run. You know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, have I got five minutes? I'm finished. I just wanted to tell you that on, on the base of the, um, sta of, the, of the statue in Vienna at the university, it says, only a good man can be a good doctor. And Dr. Reich was both a good man and a good doctor. And a great human being. Thank you.